Good afternoon. Welcome to our weekly livestock market update. I'm Brownfield anchor reporter Megan Grubner. With us is University of Missouri livestock economist Scott Brown. Good afternoon, Scott. Good afternoon, Megan. Welcome back. We're glad you're feeling better this week. It is nice to be recovered. I will say that. <laughs> All right. So we're chatting here at midday today on Friday. Let's recap what's happened so far this week in the markets. Yeah, if we start on the cattle side of the equation, you know, we're going to talk about uh, uh, live cattle that are uh, probably a dollar fifty higher for the week uh, on the cash feeder uh, cattle side. Uh, really, one to five lower this week in those markets. Uh, on the uh, future side, live cattle futures uh, February that are basically uh, unchanged as we speak here, and the January feeder cattle futures contract that's uh, trading a, a little more than a dollar fifty lower for the week. Uh, if we move to the choice box beef price, uh, again virtually unchanged. Uh, from where we were a, a week ago. Uh, we have seen a little bit of widening in that choice select spread, uh, not uh, nearly a dollar uh, this week relative to a week ago, uh, but that still is uh, well below where we were a year ago th this time in terms of the choice select spread. Uh, on the hog side of the equation, bear on gilt prices this week, basically unchanged uh, in cash markets. While the February lean hog futures contract has been trading lower, uh, close to a dollar lower for the week so far. Uh, got a lot of strength in the pork cutout value this week, up nearly $3 uh, this week. I'd remind us that's still uh, $12 below where we were a year ago at this time. Uh, we had strength across the, the board this week and all the cuts, but uh, really bellies led the way in getting us a uh, higher pork cutout value for the week. Not a ton of reports for us to talk about this week. We're going to focus a lot on the demand picture, uh, which is especially, I think, important as we're looking at massive uh, slaughter runs on both really the cattle and hog side of things. We know there's a lot of beef and pork coming to market. Scott, as we take a look at one of those two reports we are going to talk about today, or three reports we're going to talk about today, uh, jobs and, and how important is what we're seeing in today day's report going to to play back and to continue demand for u.s products yes yeah, so i think it is important uh what, what we got today so we out of the jobs report we did get more jobs added and i think it's important to remind us that we've been on a long string of adding jobs and the rate that we've been adding jobs is, is probably tough for us to continue long term so we got 155,000 jobs added in november that did come in below the pre-report average of nearly 200,000. Uh, however, unemployment rates with that 155,000 ads uh, remained unchanged at 3.7% this month. So we're adding jobs. We're just starting to see maybe a little bit of slowdown in terms of the new jobs added. And that certainly comes at a time where we need more demand for uh, pork and beef, uh, not, not less. So we'll be paying very close attention to those jobs reports as we continue to move forward. Scott, does it come at a weird time to see maybe a little bit of, of a slowdown or, or us not add as many jobs as we had expected, especially going into that seasonal uptick? Because I would assume that we'll see more jobs in December based specifically on the holiday season and some of those seasonal related jobs. Yeah, so it is a little bit less than we expected. Again, I think uh, if you look back at, at what we have been through, some of the weather events, so uh, we, we had winter maybe hit a little earlier that would have... Uh, been a little bit of drag on the job side of the equation. So I think we'll have to wait and see whether uh, th this is some signal that the economy is somehow generating a little less growth or was just a short-term weather event. Uh, so th those December numbers will be important for us to take a look at as well. On the other side of the the picture on the demand side of things, we talk about consumer confidence. And um, as we take a look at those numbers, any surprises in there? Well, I think when you look at the components of those numbers, it's, it is important in terms of this preliminary December uh, consumer confidence that information that we got out this morning. The overall index is unchanged relative to the previous month, uh, yet relative to a year ago, it is still 1.7% higher. So good news by and large relative to where we've been, but uh, unchanged month over month. Yet when you dig into the components of so the current economic conditions, we actually saw month over month, we were up 2.6%. So I, I sometimes go more money in the pocket right now, which is really helpful. Uh, and and I, I think as we talk about large meat supplies here for the remainder of the year could be helpful. Yet the index of expectations 
uh, month over month was down 2.3 percent. Now that that expectations is still 2.1 percent above a year ago level. So I want to make sure I frame it the the reference a little bit here, but. Maybe some suggesting uh, perhaps a little bit of a uh, slowdown in, in where we're headed in front of us that's coming out of that data that I want to be paying attention to as we know 2019 is going to bring more meat supplies to the marketplace, not less. And consumer demand here in the United States remains important to what prices clear those markets. We know domestic demand remains vital to price support here uh, for U.S. cattle and and. and- or beef and pork producers, but global demand and global trade also remains a vital component. As we take a look at that monthly trade data, um, another big month for beef. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, we have been seeing, I guess, a little bit of slowing from some of the big growth we saw back in the summer months. But you look at the beef side of the equation, we're up uh, 4.7% uh, in October relative to a year ago in terms of, of volume with a value that was nearly 10% higher. Uh, that That's all pretty good news when you see what's uh, happening on the beef side of the equation. I continue to remind us on the pork side. So we've been up every month in terms of the quantity of pork that we've exported out of the United States, despite tariffs to places like Mexico and China that have been uh, troubling or, or harmful to that trade growth. The, the problem's really been that the value now, when we look at October, uh, was 3% lower than it was a year ago at this time. So we've maintained volume, but unfortunately lost some on the value side. Uh, you, you certainly can look at what's happening in Mexico with those tariffs in place that I think has been harmful uh, to, to that value. Uh, e- even when you start looking at the pork variety meat, so a little bit of this uh, China discussion here, uh, 32% lower than where we were a year ago at this time in terms of the value of pork variety meat exports. Uh, that, that certainly has uh, been, been a drag in terms of uh, pork prices here in the United States. Man, and everything looks pretty rosy coming out of the G20 last week. Uh, we thought we were seeing a, a big, uh, at least the first steps in easing that those trade tensions with China and things have been uh, a little tumultuous this week. We saw a little backpedaling maybe coming out of China, but we know we have large supplies, especially of pork, coming through the end of the year. How does that demand uncertainty and that continued those continued tariffs play into the market and into prices? Yeah, I, so I like to remind us all the time that yes, we're going to have large supplies. I, I don't think that's really in question at this point, and. We don't want to forget that markets have to deal with those kinds of record meat supplies. We have seen weeks here recently where you know we hit number one in terms of weekly pork production, for example, uh, large supplies of beef on the marketplace as well. So, so that has to be the focus of markets at times. You, you have this, this on again, off again, strong one week, week the next in terms of what happens on the trade front. Uh, that I think is going to keep the volatility at, at some fairly high levels. Now, I always say volatility has two sides to it. Those times when we can get some higher prices as we get positive news, like with the G20 uh, news, that might give us an opportunity to uh, take advantage of some higher prices that maybe we should be thinking about. Because um, we, we likely get the flip side continuing to occur of then maybe not quite as uh, as hopeful as, as we would have been a few days prior. I think that on again, off again will continue to happen uh, that, that, again, gives us opportunities, but we don't want to be selling in those low periods if, if we can help it, which, by the way, if trade isn't very strong in 2019 and we have these record meat supplies coming, the pressure on prices is likely there. And that's why I'm like, how do you – how do you want to protect downside risk, but give yourself an opportunity for some upside potential that could come from things like African swine fever, for example? Do we, does the market at some point get into a chicken little situation where uh, the sky, you know, the sky is falling, we have resolution, and then we don't have uh, resolve to the trade issues? Do, do they get to a point where it just doesn't move? the market anymore because we've been back and forth so many times? 
I'm not convinced just given where markets are today that we don't continue to see a lot of volatility week to week. Uh, we, we trade a lot on the very current information that's available to us and, and tend to use that like it's going to unfold. Once we get there, however, um, eventually this idea that supplies are big and continue to keep at least some lid on prices. I, I get so worried because I feel like, you know, we're setting at these very far extremes in terms of, of where we could be in 2019. I could tell a very pessimistic story that large meat supplies meet with a U.S. economy that slows considerably next year. And we don't do anything on the trade side to really get a, a lot of positive boost there. I don't like that scenario very well because I think that's a low price scenario. Yet at the same time, I could tell the other end of the spectrum that says, hey, we get all these tariffs that, that have been in place over the last 12 months out of the way. We get a lot of strength. The U.S. economy continues to grow along. And oh, by the way, we have huge ASF problems in China, but nowhere else in the world that uh, I, I think under that scenario can be very high. But being in the middle is tough for me to, to, to figure out that combination yet. And, and I, the risk of all of that is what uh, concerns me as, as we head into 2019. Scott, as we wrap things up this week, we take a look at next week. Uh, what reports are we looking ahead to and what are we watching for from those? Yep. So next week we will get USDA to give us another uh, monthly uh, report on WASD. That'll come out on Tuesday while we get retail prices uh, next Wednesday uh, in, in a report there. All right. We will talk to you next Friday. Have a great week. You do the same, Megan. Thanks, Scott. To have our weekly livestock market update delivered to your email box every Saturday morning, visit our website, brownfieldagnews.com. You can click subscribe. You can also submit questions and comments there as well. And for market updates twice daily, make sure to check out John Perkins Market Minute. Have a great weekend. I'm Megan Grebner for Brownfield.